Hi, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. So the title of my talk is Verifying Algorithmic Claims. What is the legal significance? And uh, this is based on work with uh, Guy Rothblum, Jonathan Schaefer, and Amir Udayo. Uh, and the name of the paper is uh, Interactive Proofs for Verifying Machine Learning in ITCS 2021. Now, obviously, this is not a computer science, uh, like you're not, uh, when, I'm not going to tell you about the technical details, but I sort of want to motivate um, in my talk uh, why verification of algorithmic claims is so important and what do we mean by uh, verifying algorithmic claims in the context of machine learning, and finally ask how, uh, even if we do this in a way that we are, as computer scientists, happy about it, what does it mean? Um, from a legal point of view, and what type of problems are gonna are we do we have to encounter a, in order to get it adopted by by um, legal scholars? So first of all, I want to say that uh, even though I gave my title two months ago, it's an extremely timely topic because of the lack of trust that's very obvious uh, in institutions and in procedures that is you know very relevant today, just with the elections. Um, so whereas maybe in the past we sort of trust a government, we would trust um, an election, uh, we would trust sort of how we, um, you know, the results we get from Google, whatever, you know, it's very clear that all that is, you know, up for grabs. It's not clear when we see an article in the press, is it true, is it not true, what is truth, um, what are the facts of the case, and the question really, I guess that the only question that us a, or me as someone who comes from the technology side or mathematics is then can we play some sort of role in uh, giving back trust? Um, and even if we do come up with some mechanisms that we think are a good idea, because we, we love to play with this, it's sort of almost like a, a playground for us, um, can it be uh, backed legally? In other words, can we have a reasonable dialogue with legal scholars so that they will um, embrace it. So in particular, you know, um, Prop 25 in California that just uh, was denied is a very interesting tale in the context of my talk. So California Proposition 25 was uh, the following. In 2018, the legislative body in California passed a Senate bill, which had two parts to it. I mean, it's formulated as one paragraph, but one was to end cash bail. So previously in California, essentially like most places, uh, you'd sort of evaluate what is the flight risk of, a, of someone who's standing for trial and depending on that um, and whether they would uh, commit a crime a, a, if you let them out on bail at the time where they were waiting for trial where they would come back, you would set some sort of um, amount of money that if they paid it, they could go out on bail. And bail bonds, um, <clears throat> you know, made a lot of money on this. Uh, and in 2018, the decision was that this was clearly uh, had a lot of racial problems, equity problems, because whoever could pay would go out on bail and whoever could not pay would not, which would lead to a lot of incarcerations of people who are poor, basically, and often of a certain skin color. So the decision was to go, move to a system where it's either bail or no bail. But in addition to that, the decision was that uh, the dis uh, who is going to make the decision of whether you're going to let someone out or not let someone out um, uh, without cash being involved. And it was uh, decided that there will be some sort of a risk assessment system. So some sort of automatic algorithm, which will be based on um, essentially data that they've had in the past of people who have been let out uh, and whether they did commit a crime, whether they did come back. And depending on that, which is all statistical evidence, um, you should the system will give a recommendation if a suspect should be released or detained. And the judge then would look at the recommendation, either accept it or reject it. So Prop 25 was to replace this, um, uh, the Senate bill. Um, it was essentially a referendum. Do we approve it or we overturn it? And uh, by a fairly large margin, it was decided not to approve it. So um, I think it's a, a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting case for this, uh, for us, both not because it's talking about law, you know, but really because it's talking about uh, this risk assessment systems and whether they um, are ready to be accepted, you know, so replace a procedure, a legal procedure by an algorithm 
essentially, or it's a recommendation, but let's say that the judge, which is also not the case, but let's say the judge would just say, yes, if you recommend it bail, I'll let it, otherwise I won't. Uh, so are we ready for it? And if not, why not? So first of all, what's a risk assessment system? That's a, a machine learning algorithm, right? So machine learning, yeah, you know, somewhere in the intersection of statistics, AI, developed computer science. The important thing is that this algorithm um, learns from data, data that's been collected in the past, or maybe data that is to be collected in order to make a good decision. And it's not explicitly pro programmed. So you're building models from inputs, you know, of the past or the things that you've collected. Uh, if we think about this theoretically, just very quickly, because I have to ground something in sort of a math definition, um, I'll think about the old definition of Valiant, which is you're given labeled examples. So in the context of uh, bail, it might be like feature vector of, of the accused and uh, whether in the past um, they, this C of X is a decision, which whether they, whether they committed a crime when you let them out um, on bail or they didn't come back or something like that. And uh, you're, getting, you're getting a whole distribution, this is a distributional data. So in other words, X comes from some sort of distribution D and uh, C of X is what happened in the past. And uh, what Valiant uh, uh, defines a PAC learning algorithm, a probabilistic and, probabilistically and approximately correct algorithm is one that looks at all these examples and then efficiently generates uh, another, uh, an hypothesis H. So H is sort of a, a proxy for C. So C is supposedly uh, what happened in the past. H is, the, is a predictor of what's going to happen on any X that's given to it. And what you'd like is, of course, that H is, uh, if we think about C as sort of the ground truth, that H will agree with C almost all the time. Maybe you can't get that. So you want it to disagree so, uh, it, 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 rarely. And, official, and that's captured by it, the probability that they disagree a, a less than epsilon of the time should be high. So you want it to be um, to, to agree most of the time. Of course, there's an issue here that C here in the Valiant's beautiful but theoretical definition is sort of ground truth. Whereas when we talk about algorithms for bail or algorithms for loans or algorithms for any kind of decision making uh, that we do um, today, you're not really comparing yourself to the ground truth. You're comparing yourself to what has been decided in the past. And that's a, a, in itself a proxy to, to the ground truth. So what happened, just going back to Prop 25, what happened there? Why, why did it get rejected? Sounds like a wonderful idea. You know, you, there's some sort of ground truth or proxy for it, and we are able to learn a, how to decide whether to let someone out on bail or not uh, quickly, efficiently, why not? So there were sort of two, uh, there was a debate. This is from some article that I pulled up on the internet, um, which sort of summarizes it. And uh, the supporters say, obviously cash bail is inherently classist, racist, unfair, uh, poor people in the same legal circumstances do not get the same, the same treatment. So um, we should absolutely uh, replace, replace it. The opponents don't disagree. I think everybody agrees to that, but the opponents were made out of two groups. One was a group that as usual is industry that stands to lose money if we're gonna to go to um, no cash bail, that's the bail industry. But they're not the ones that are interesting in this talk. It's the civil rights advocates that are interesting uh, for this talk because it turned out that even though the whole point was, uh, you know, essentially to help poor people, to help, uh, let's say, let's say um, a, people from African-American uh, groups that have mass incarcerations, uh, much more than anybody else, uh, especially in California, is that they feel, and here's that while algorithms can, a quote here, can pitch you a song or sell you a toaster, they should not be used to, for release decisions. The factors considered for release will still lead to people of color being held for trial at disproportionate rates. So Prop 25 is further from the existing problem but no closer to the solution. So the feeling here basically is that algorithms cannot be trusted, that algorithms are not going to be able to do justice to this problem and that we should not trust algorithms. So it's very amorphic, uh, you know, um, but it was not surprising to me. And why? Because a few years ago, we ran a workshop, actually the Simons Institute called uh, Wrong at the Root, Racial Bias and the Tension Between Numbers and Words and Non-Internet Data. It was run by Cynthia Dwork and by uh, Pat Williams, um, who was a legal scholar. It was very interested in issues of race and identity. Um, and 
the entire workshop was a surprise to me at the time. So it was a bunch of computer scientists who want to do good, who want to replace algorithms, who want to come up with notion of fairness, algorithms which are more fair than what decisions procedures are today and uh, design uh, such algorithms uh, based maybe on machine learning algorithms based on statistics of the past, trying to understand if there was bias in the past statistics and remove it. And yet, um, essentially the premise for this workshop and everybody else except for the computer, computer scientists was why do you think that you know what you're talking about? And one and two, why should we believe you? And that's really the question of this talk. How do we, um, how do we to believe that these algorithms you're gonna put in place are really going to remove bias, are gonna be better than what's there and you're not putting in sort of new, new problems in. So in particular, this is the abstract to the workshop. And um, you know, they're asking sort of who or what determines our fitness for inclusion within newly constituted technological communities. Our, who determines our risk factors is governed by probabilistic modeling. They pointed out that once we put these algorithms in place that will affect standards, IRBs in the, in the context of me medicine, for example. Um, fiduciary relationships, uh, the right to uh, be free from unwarranted search and seizure, the right not to testify against yourself and, and further and more and more. And then the kind of conclusion is that ungoverned data-driven assortments are creating new forms of stigma, disparate impact and group discrimination. So the operative word here, which is why I kind of circled it in, uh, in red or uh, highlighted in red is that if it's things should be governed so how governed? And uh, then uh, Martha Minow was on one of the panels and she listed a, a, a bunch of um, a, uh, um, things that should follow for any kind of governance procedure or should be followed by a governance procedure. It should be participatory, responsive, inclusive, follows from the rule of law, accurate and efficient. And she made the remark that accurate and efficient, she believes in algorithms, but how about the rest? So, um, you know, another thing that was said in the, in, the, in, the, in the panel, which I think is interesting for us to discuss on this point of view of verification and governance from a computer science point of view, as opposed to other um, governance examples. Uh, so it was pointed out that there's always governance really in, in markets, you know, there are corporate boards, uh, there are law and regulations, there are, you know, in, the, in, in ethics, you know, there's sort of norms. And in technical, you know, the suggestion was thrown out there is um, that we should talk about data governance and standards for algorithms and code verification and so forth. So here I turn really to from motivation to sort of talking about what would I as a CS person, uh, how would I really uh, address this question? So if we're talking about building machine learning algorithm to replace bail, for example, or to do risk scores and so forth, the first things that I would ask is, before we talk about participatory and all that, is who, um, who is it, is, is, you're building an algorithm, who's building the algorithm? Um, and uh, what past data does the algorithm designer have access to? Where does it do the training? So we know that machine learning is quite intensive in terms of use of data and use of hardware. Are they training it on their own premises? Are they training it in the cloud? Um, they're using randomness most likely because um, we're talking about statistics and random sampling is very important. What kind of randomness are they using? Where did it come from? And in this talk specifically, uh, I'm actually even more curious that regardless of the builder of the algorithm and regardless of what they did and randomness that they used, I don't wanna trust that. I wanna be able to verify once the code is done, okay, once the, uh, the algorithm builder has came up with an hypothesis, the machine learning algorithm, came up with an H that supposedly predicts the ground truth. Um, uh, I'd like to be able to verify it. And again, there's a host of questions. Does a verifier have open source access to this machine learning algorithm? Does a verifier have access to historical data so I can check this machine learning algorithm against it? And uh, in what formal sense in any case, even going back to zooming out and asking the inherent questions, in what formal sense can a machine learning algorithm be verified as correct? So what does it mean that it's correct or that it's accurate? And uh, 
after I've done that, let's say that I've managed to give a good definition and achieve it, now there's a platform that the machine learning algorithm sits on. Uh, how to make sure that, in fact, what sits there is what is the same algorithm that we verify. So cases where code has been updated, patched, have happened. And in the course of patching or updating, uh, the whole verification thing can go out the window. So th those are two questions. What does it mean to verify a machine learning algorithm? And how to make sure once we've done that, that the thing that we are running uh, is exactly the same thing that we verified. And if we want to update it, how can we verify sort of uh, um, these updates? So um, before I come tell you the de definition that we are proposing in this paper, I want to say that there's a lot of lessons from electronic vo voting, I think that can be learned. Um, so you, maybe some of you remember that quite a while ago, a, there was a counting, I think it was like 2004, there were these electronic voting machines that put, were put into place. And then some small county in California discovered they, by chance that some software that tabulated, um, a, 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 that they used to tally votes um, just dropped like 197 um, a, a, a votes from the totals. And as a result of that, really, uh, it was reversed. So um, a California decided, the state uh, attorney decided that the, that the, um, that the executive, that, so, uh, that the counties should revert back to older technology. So this move to electronic voting was reversed. Uh, electronic voting of sorts, electronic voting machines. And you know these were specific machines by these uh, Diablo uh, AccuVote uh, voting machines. There were papers about it. Why there was a mistake? There was some sort of hardware bug. And one of the big conclusions was that it's not sufficient to just have a, a machine work. You need paper trail. You need a way to verify after the fact. So one thing is to tally with privacy. Another thing is to verify. And it absolutely, it must be the case that you can't just uh, have it disappear. You need to have some record of it. Now, why paper trail is unclear, but that's what was decided in the context of uh, electronic votes. And in fact, there's um, generalizing, right? There's a definition of a software independence by reverse and woke, where they said that a voting system is software independent if an undetected change or error in its software cannot cause an undetectable change or error in the, in the outcome. So, so that's very interesting. Basically, they're saying uh, it's software independent if we can verify independent of the software. So the emphasis is that we will be able to detect. Okay, so they're talking about detect. I, I, I use the word verify. So we have absolutely have to be able to detect if there is an error. Um, so an interesting, there's an interesting talk actually online by Alon uh, Rosen on elections, which he says, but wait a second, uh, why can't we do this? You know, look at aviation, the, the, the pilots are using plane, planes are being flown, flown by automatic systems. Why can't we have boats that just happen automatically? And how about the banking system? Everything is open, is doing automatically. And he answers that again, it's about detecting errors. So in the case of aviation, if something goes wrong, we all know about it. And in the case of banking, there is paper trail. There's always reports and documents and you can verify it. So we need a verification mechanism. Um, and um, that's really the topic of my talk. I hope I'm not out of time. No. Um, so what kind of verification tools do we have uh, for algorithms? So first of all, there's the whole field of program verification, software verification. That's a very uh, formal uh, field, very well grounded in mathematical logic, but it's also a very difficult field. So the kind of systems we are talking about uh, do not exactly lend themselves to program verification. Uh, another way to go is <clears throat> essentially uh, to go into the land of interactive proofs. So where you would um, be able to get a proof that might have a probability of error in it, uh, but it's small. Uh, this allows you things like zero knowledge interactive proofs. So in other words, you don't have to go into even the guts of the program. You can sort of view it as a black box, but you get proofs of correctness or, or correctness of outcome. And there's non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. I I'll talk about all this as, as we go along. But the truth is that yes, we have these tools. We inherit this from cryptographic research of the last 35 years or so, at least the three bullets that don't have to do with program verification. But we haven't actually answered the key question is what is that we are verifying? 
in, in the context of machine learning, it's not a simple statement like n is a product of two prime factors, n is equal to pq, or that there's some uh, input and output, and you want to de decide that the in f, you know, input and output uh, satisfy some fixed relationship. It's a data-driven algorithm. So what is it that you're actually verifying when somebody gives you a machine learning algorithm and tells you that it's 98% accurate? Um, so I think that the first thing to answer is the accuracy of the model with respect to a distribution. So a lot of things you might want to verify in the context of bail or loans, and they have to do with fairness and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But first of all, before we talk about that, let's just talk about accuracy with respect to a distribution. And um, since, I, since I'm a cryptographer, I am going to go to cryptography-like methods to verify accuracy. Of course, after that's done, we still need to address the question of, I'm running now this model that may have been verified accurately on a, and I wanna make sure that the infrastructure has ways to detect if the model has been changed. And for that, you can use things like delegating computations so proving that the result of the computation is really by running the, the model uh, and a lot of system security answers. So I'm gonna tell you what is this proof system in the context of machine learning? And what do I mean by verifying accuracy with respect to distribution? So my mandatory slide in any talk that talks about interactive proofs is that in math, we trust. So all of this is gonna be grounded in mathematics, not in law. And later we'll see what are the issues when we wanna ground this in law. So we're talking mathematical proofs. We're not talking about the old type of mathematical proofs like geometry proof, the kind that are written in paper. But we're talking about computer science-like proofs. So what I mean by that is that there are algorithms involved. There's the proving algorithm uh, on the uh, left here. There's the verifier algorithm on the right. And there is some claim to be proved and a proof that's shift, shipped over in some sort of a, um, you can think of it as a message over the internet. I want to think of um, what it takes for the verifier um, to verify a claim. And I want to say that the verifier is working is going to work a, a lot less, should work a lot less than the prover. Otherwise, you, you could just redo everything the prover has done, and he doesn't verify the claim in, himself. And usually in this context of proving and verifying, we talk about two requirements. One is completeness. We want to make sure that the prover should be able to prove claims which are correct and soundness. And we, we want to make sure that regardless of prover strategy, he should not be able to prove incorrect claims. So that's a little similar to uh, the reverse notion, reverse and, and, and wake notion, where they were saying about software independence that regardless of what the software was, if I think about the prover as the software that's proving something about itself, if it's if it did not perform its task correctly in the context of election at that point, you will detect it. So soundness is guaranteed implicitly in that definition. So you cannot go undetected if you are proving incorrect claims. Um, we, in the context of uh, cryptography, add one more component. And that is not only actually two components. And that is, OK, so we have someone who's trying to prove uh, something about their software. We have a verifier who wants to verify the claim. Again, I haven't said yet what the claim is in the context of machine learning. I'm getting to it. I just want to set up the, the the platform. So we have someone who's proving, we have someone who's verifying. The proof now, the two new ingredients is that they might be a question and answer period. So it's participatory in some sense. So it's not just sending the proof over, but there could be a question and answer. And the second ingredient is I still have completeness and soundness, but I'm going to allow some small probability of failure. So I'm letting probability come into the game. I'm saying that if this proving algorithm it has a mistake, Okay, I want him with overwhelming uh, only high probability to be to be caught, but uh, I'm not guarantee it 100% of the time. So here, formally, I'm saying two thirds, but two thirds is too small. So if the claim is false, it should be rejected. Probability greater than two thirds. Two thirds is just arbitrary. We can you can think of, you should think of this as you know one minus minuscule. So it's extreme, all but negligible probability. Okay, so finally, let's get to the machine learning. Uh, setting. We still are going to have a prover and a verifier. However, I want to think about the prover now as someone who's actually machine lear learning algorithm. And he first does machine learning, and then he sends the result of machine learning algorithm 
uh, the hypothesis to the verifier. Now, how did this machine algorithm work? I have no idea. It's a black box, but I do know that it had access to a distribution. So by a distribution is like we talked in the past, in the past, if you abstractly. So like in the valiant pack, there are inputs, which in the case of Bale, let's say they're features of, of, of the accused and there are um, labels. So this F of X is what I called C of X before. So it's like saying uh, whether this person actually, if he was released on bail, did he commit crime or didn't commit crime? And the learner has, let's say, access to this entire distribution. Maybe he can even run experiments uh, and see what the outcome would be. So there might be a period of running experiments. And at the end, he comes with an algorithm. And he says, this is a great bail, no bail algorithm. Here, take it. The verifier doesn't believe it blindly. He actually might, he examines this hypothesis, asks questions from the learner and, the, uh, and gets answers and has access to the distribution itself. And at the end, he either accepts the hypothesis or rejects it. Now, um, you know, the learner and the verifier, you know, the first question is who needs the learner then? The verifier could do it himself. Well, obviously not. The learner might have put a tremendous amount of resources into this. It's taken a lot of time. Might have run experiments to figure out labels f of x. The verifier may not have that kind of time and he certainly doesn't have that kind of data access. So he shouldn't necessarily have access to the entire distribution. Uh, he might not be able to run experiments and just get random access. So the difference could be quantitative. So the amount of data the verifier has is less or qualitative, so his type of access. So he might just have random access rather than the ability of running experiments or what we call membership queries. So again, just to ground this back in uh, machine learning, you're thinking about even a verifier outsourcing a task to the prover. The prover collects lots of high quality data, trains a good model, gives it back to the verifier and the verifier looks at the model and maybe tests it on some random examples that he's tested in, he, that he has from the distribution. And he says it has accuracy 80%. Should he accept or reject the model? And what we are going to do is define a new kind of uh, a, a interactive proof for distributions. And we will call this prob a pack verification rather than pack learning. We'll say, okay, this is kind of technical, but it's like, this is the only technical slide here in the whole talk. We will say in this particular definition that we provide that a class of hypothesis so we're looking at a class of hypotheses. So by class, I mean, let's say it's a decision tree or it's a neural net, it's a class of possible machine learning algorithms. We'll say that they are, such a class is verifiable, pack verifiable, if there is an, a verifying algorithm, a verifier, such that for all two these parameters, epsilon, delta, and distribution, the following is true. There is some sort of loss, right? I mean, um, loss meaning th this machine learning algorithm is not always gonna be correct. So I, I um, unless it's, it's a, it just copied everything in the past and a, a, but that's not a good machine learning algorithm. You want it to be a good predictor and um, for the future and table lookup isn't gonna do it for you. So in any case, there's a certain loss, which is how much it, it's incorrect with respect to the past. And in the class of hypotheses that are allowed, let's say that there's sort of the, 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 best, the best hypothesis, that's the optimal uh, loss. And the smallest amount of loss, such a, class of algorithm can have, then we will require that completeness is there is a way that the algorithm, the prover can convince the verifier to accept, but that's only gonna happen when the loss of this hypothesis that I got, so this should be a small, uh, um, a lower class H, is close to the optimal. So the difference between what I got and the optimal is less than epsilon with, with high probability. And if the prover is, uh, is not doing what his job correctly, and he's trying to convince you to accept an algorithm which is inaccurate, we defined by saying that the loss of what he sent you is far away from what he could, you know, a good system would do, then regardless of what the prover does, regardless of what his program is, regardless of how clever it is, or regardless of his software in the spirit of software independence, the verifier will reject, okay? And we want, of course, this to be what we call double efficient is that we want that this prover that not only has to do machine learning, but also convince you, doesn't have to work so much more hard or so much harder a, a, to convince you. And secondly, that the verifier could decide, accept or reject relatively easily. 
Um, indeed, this question of can verifying be, the question is, can it, this actually be true? Can you verify much cheaply than learning um, when you talk about verifying machine learning? So verifying distribution, or in other words, this, uh, this um, definition that I gave, how hard is it to achieve and still have an efficient verifier? And um, a, we have some things to say about that. First of all, the realizable case uh, where actually there is a perfect hypothesis in this class is trivial. So the verifier um, and the provers are not really different from each other. You just need to do random samples and, um, and um, this is sort of a factor of D, which is the VC dimension, some technical notion a difference. But the agnostic case is interesting. So usually, you know, decision trees, um, neural nets, whatever, they're not perfect. And there's a difference between, uh, um, you know, perfect uh, uh, ground truth and, and the best that you can do. And if you think about it, what did we want? We wanted the hypothesis I got from the learner is not too far from the optimal. The hypothesis that I got from the learner, I can tell how good it is, but I don't know how far it is from how good it could be. This is what's hard to estimate. So the challenge is the proven needs to show me essentially that this is uh, this optimal is close to what he sent you. So that this is large. And we get a bunch of results. Essentially, first of all, that there is a sequence of classes where there is a separation, where um, you, um, if you sort of uh, think about the index here that is the VC dimension, you know, there is a separation between learning and verifying. If learning takes this many random samples, uh, omega of D, then verifying could be just uh, be done with square root of D. There's lower bounds. Sometimes there is no difference between learning and verify. Maybe the most interesting result is that for a class of meaningful functions, so these are a, essentially a, a Boolean functions, decision functions, yes, no, which can be approximated by a sparse a, a, a functions in the bullet in the Fourier representation basis. It is there's a qualitative, not just quantitative difference between proving and verifying. So where uh, for such a class, the learner has to actually run experiments or he has to ask me membership queries from the distribution. He has to give an X and get back F of X and then adaptively choose another X and get back F of X in order to make, uh, to build a model. The verifier, once he receives the model that has been learned can actually verify its accuracy just with random samples. And uh, that is a huge difference between the type of access you have to data. And if we go back to kind of verifying algorithmic systems, it says that we will be able to verify whether a piece of software is as accurate as, uh, as, as being professed with a lot uh, easier time than learning ourselves. Um, okay, so that's essentially uh, what I have to say about that. Just a few last comments. I, I think I still have time, I hope. Do I? My um, few more minutes? Yes, sorry, you have uh, about 10 more minutes if you'd okay. like. So just a few remarks. And that is that um, this, if the model that I showed, the learner or prover was sending over the hypothesis openly. One of the big things in this whole algorithmic uh, verifiability is that um, the, these companies, let's say in the bail case, they were not gonna give open source because they claim that this is loss of, uh, you know, this infringes on their right maybe to sell it somewhere else. But what's very important is that um, the results that we show, and it's also the definition in a sense, uh, doesn't say it, but we could require it because the results certainly work that way, are black, have used black box access to the software. So we don't really need to look at the guts of the software like security research does, or um, a, a program verification, but we access H in a black box manner. So in principle, we could use, uh, essentially encrypt these programs and use zero knowledge uh, proofs. So adding to the interactive proofs a zero knowledge requirement to verify a uh, functionality. So we don't necessarily have to look at the program and it's open source. However, it's not clear what the legal norms are uh, when we talk about zero knowledge proofs. It's some, a matter of discussion. So in other words, in crypto, we accept that zero knowledge proof is, is fine. That even though we don't look at the evidence, we prove because of the mathematically we show that this, the, the, the interaction uh, essentially uh, is the same as 
um, it convinces you that I have, I have the facts, I have the program in my hands, and I'm proving facts about this program. But legal norms have to be, uh, you know, this is something that has to be discussed by legal scholars. Another thing is that this introduction of probability into interactive proofs, or which is inherent in a statistical setting, right? There's some probability that these algorithms are going to make a mistake. It's learning from evidence, it's collecting statistical evidence, and depending on your feature input, it's going to decide whether the evidence is uh, that statistically you're likely to commit a crime in the, uh, and therefore I'm not gonna release you on bail. And statistics and probabilities in legal settings have, are sort of a very problematic area. So I've read a few papers about it. I'm sure everybody else on the call here is a better, in better informed, but just from what I read, you know, there's a, a nice paper from a year ago on statistics in courts, incorrect probabilities, which talks about a bunch of cases from the past going back to 1868, where, um, you know, someone, uh, somebody's will it was contested and then the whole thing came down to whether two signatures were the same or not. And, and there's a, there was a forgery trial where they were talking about the probabilities that finding 30 downstrokes was one in, uh, I don't know, some fraction of a billion. But it then turned out that the way that they were calculating these probabilities was by using the product rule, like the probability of a bunch of events. Each event was one in a million and then they multiplied all these events together. But it was actually not independent. So you cannot use the product rule. And same thing, I think, was in a case of uh, Sally Clark, where there was the death of an infant, and they um, decided that she was, uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't um, accidental death, but the mother was responsible. And then it turned out, again, that the, they were not using, um, they, were, they were viewing some events as independent and calculating probabilities in that case. And in that case, even the, ju the judge says explicitly, although we don't con Victim in these codes based on statistics, the statistics are overwhelming or compelling. And then there was another, um, there's lots of cases, they're very interesting cases. Some about identities, uh, identity versus, I don't know, medical evidence. Uh, I think about somebody biting someone else and whether the, you know, the bite looked identical to the person's dentures. Another one was about um, uh, signatures. Another one was how likely is a child to, pass away um, when a mother is a certain age and this baby is a certain age and so forth. And um, what is the lessons from it? The lessons is not to use, is not to discard statistics, but that we need to learn how to evaluate statistics. So, you know, there's the famous um, uh, Johnny Cochran thinks that if it doesn't fit, you must acquit with the glove, but we know the gloves sometimes fit, sometimes don't fit, depends on the time of day. So we're certainly not gonna just throw away statistics and probability, but we need to know how to evaluate. And we need to understand sort of the base rate. What does it mean that there's some statistics to indicate that with a certain profile and a certain uh, history, you are likely to not pay bail? Um, another thing I think that is important is to understand where there's the random is coming from in this setting of prover and verifier and the verifier is getting a random sample. Random sampling is key. And where is it coming from? So we know cautionary tale from crypto that uh, generating of RSA keys was, you know, the pseudo random numbers that were being used were, um, yeah, thanks, five minutes. Uh, the pseudo random numbers that were being used were related to each other uh, and, and therefore, <clears throat> just by collecting keys on the internet, you could just factor them because there was relationship between keys because they use bad randomness or at least the same randomness. So I think that also here, it's something that um, probably will legally have to contend with this idea that something is random. Um, another thing is the last thing I wanna say is, I assume that the adversary you know, was this learner and I wanna be independent of that adversary, um, but you know, there's a, it is a good question of who is this adversary. In my mind, it was just an algorithm that had uh, access to the distribution, couldn't change the distribution. Um, but um, Aloni Cohen actually, who gave a talk here, I think yesterday, or maybe today, I don't call anymore. Uh, I just had an interesting discussion with him is that, you know, the adversary in a legal setting uh, might be uh, someone who has uh, law enforcement powers in addition to usual computational resources. And that might be the adversary that we need to talk about. And what does that mean? That they can not allow us to look at the distribution fully. Maybe they have a change to the distribution. 
Um, I think that uh, is a very interesting question. Um, I'm going to stop here.